Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kira Proctor, and I'm the Managing Director of the A. Proctor Group Limited, and this is the 15th in our series of webinars. Since starting back in April, we've covered a huge range of topics, materials and applications, and all our webinars and the accompanying Q&A sessions are available to watch on demand, either on our Learning Hub at www.proctorgroup.com or right here on our YouTube channel. We also have a range of CPD presentations and a team of technical experts across the country, so you can also book a follow-up call or project consultation via our website. Lastly, registered users can get notification of our range of webinars as they're announced and can order sample packs of all the materials featured in each webinar. Today we're going to take a look at facade systems and specifically how we design for fire protection and to limit air leakage. As usual, we'll be following up with a Q&A session so you can submit your questions to our team via email to webinar at proctorgroup.com, DM us on Twitter at proctorgroup or type them here in the YouTube chat. We'll begin by taking a look at the relevant sections of the building regulations across the UK and Ireland and some of the principal design considerations and criteria that apply to facade systems. We'll then look at how we can assess the hydrothermal performance of the system to ensure the building delivers good performance in respect of moisture and heat flow. Taken together, these factors allow us to define a framework into which our proposed solutions must fit. From there, we'll move on to look in more detail at the effects of our facade system design on the overall air leakage rate of the building and what products, systems and details we can use to optimise this. Finally, we'll consider how these solutions behave in terms of reaction to fire and how we can manage any associated risks without compromising hydrothermal or air leakage performance. Today we'll be concentrating mainly on the sections of building regulations dealing with fire and energy performance. However, these factors must also be considered alongside ensuring moisture is adequately managed. This balanced and holistic design approach is the key to achieving a successful, efficient and robust facade design. The fire performance of a facade system is addressed in Part B in England and Wales, Section 2 in Scotland, Part E in Northern Ireland and Technical Guidance Document B in the Republic of Ireland. As always, there are some differences which we'll highlight, but we'll try to keep as broadly applicable as we can. The Building Research Establishment's BRE 135 guidance document is also important when considering fire design, as is Regulation 7, covering materials and workmanship. The ADB and Regulation 7 documents were revised in 2018 to clarify what was historically considered a somewhat ambiguous message around what exactly the requirements for material entailed. The newer guidance also established a class of relevant buildings, essentially any building used for residential purposes over 18 metres in height, to which enhanced requirements apply. In such circumstances, most material used in the facade build-up are expected to achieve a Euro Class A2 reaction to fire classification. However, the regulations also recognise that some materials, such as vapour permeable membranes, may not be able to achieve this without severely compromising their essential functions. At the same time, these membranes will make an extremely limited contribution to the development of the fire owing to their relative lack of calorific value. Hence, approved document B includes this exemption clause. Membranes used as part of the external wall construction should achieve a minimum classification of European class BS3 D0. A similar exemption is provided in the Scottish Technical Standard 2, but the cut-off point for a construction to be considered as high-rise is lower in Scotland, at 11 metres as opposed to 18 metres. We'll come back to look at the testing and justification behind this exemption a little later in this presentation, but it's an important example of the importance of balancing the often conflicting performance requirements inherent in achieving a successful overall design. The essential function of a vapour permeable membrane in a facade is to provide a secondary barrier to the ingress of moisture and to facilitate the drying out of internal moisture. This can come from both concrete, screeds and other wet trades and also from the building occupants. If not adequately controlled, this moisture can lead to condensation, damp and mould growth. This in turn can lead to indoor air quality problems, affecting the health of the building users or even damage the fabric of the building itself. 
Condensation and moisture control are covered by Part C for England and Wales, Section 3 in Scotland and Part F in the Republic of Ireland. Northern Ireland is also Part C, but it's a different document from that applying to England and Wales. In regards to controlling condensation, the relevant clauses in all of these regulations refer the specifier to BS 5250, the Code of Practice for the Management of Moisture in Buildings. This means that wherever in the UK or Ireland a building is, the applicable design principles in terms of minimising the effects of condensation are more or less the same. We've covered this guidance and various aspects of moisture control in general in several of our webinars, so if it's of interest to you, please go back and check these out to get some more detail, or book an appointment with one of our advisors. The second of our main topics today, air tightness, is addressed in the sections of building regulations relating to energy performance. This means approved document L in England and Wales, technical standard 6 in Scotland, technical booklet K in Northern Ireland, and guidance document L in the Republic of Ireland. In most of these cases, the energy performance requirements can be slightly different across the regulations and also vary with building use. Non-domestic structures such as offices or commercial properties are assessed differently from housing. There are, however, a few common elements, so the general principles are widely applicable, although the specific details may differ little. In respect of air tightness, the regulations typically demand a pressure test to be conducted to determine the level of air leakage and provide a method for incorporating this into the overall heat loss assessment. They typically also give a backstop or worst acceptable value. Depending on the regulations, this backstop is typically around 7 to 10 metres cubed per square metre per hour. The energy performance of the structure is influenced by the level of thermal insulation, the detailing of the thermal envelope at junctions and the levels of air leakage. Over time, the levels of insulation applied to buildings have increased significantly, and in line with this, the influence of the other factors has grown, with heat loss at junctions known as cold bridging and air leakage now the areas where the most effective improvements can be made. While adding increasingly thick insulation boards to a facade will certainly reduce the heat loss, the way thermal transmittance or U-values are calculated means that this thickness will increase exponentially and can become quickly impractical. This increased thickness will have a knock-on effect of the specification of door and window flashing, lengths of fixings and brackets required, and the building footprint and internal space, and many other factors. Whilst reducing cold bridging will certainly help address this, the most dramatic gains in energy efficiency come from minimising air leakage, allowing energy performance to be maintained or increased without these dramatic increases in thicknesses. If the air leakage in a facade is not adequately controlled, the flow or air around between the insulating layers can effectively bypass the thermal insulation, leading to a less efficient building. This airflow can also introduce cold spots internally or allow moisture-laden warm air to penetrate into cold areas of the building fabric. This can, in turn, lead to the development of condensation and damp problems, further highlighting the interlinked nature of heat loss, fabric insulation and air leakage, and the importance of a holistic design methodology. So let's now take a look at some of the considerations that will influence the overall design. This diagram highlights the basic factors that will influence a successful hydrothermal design strategy. The start point of the design should be the purpose of the building and the occupancy levels that it will experience in service. Higher occupancy buildings like residential structures or hotels will have different requirements from offices or retail buildings like department stores. These differences will be apparent in the differing internal conditions for temperature and humidity and this will influence the moisture load on the building. This is perhaps the most important consideration as, at the end of the day, the building must be fit per purpose and must be designed to meet the role for which it is required. If the occupancy patterns and uses of the building give the baseline for internal environmental considerations, the next part of the design must be to consider the external conditions, mainly influenced by local weather conditions. Although designers clearly cannot control the weather itself, the precise locations and orientation of the structure can have an effect. The positions of surrounding structures and geographical features such as hills and cliffs can affect the anticipated wind loads, 
and the degree of shelter provided against wind-driven rain and snow. This, along with the orientation of windows and the specific locations of rooms within the building, can also affect the potential for solar heat gain, which in turn will influence the heating or cooling requirements for the building. The last of the top level factors to consider is the fabric of the building itself. Of the three elements in the outer ring of design factors, it is this over which designers have the most control. As well as the locations of particular rooms and the orientation of windows, the basic materials the building is made from will also influence the hydrothermal response. A concrete building, for example, will have a higher initial moisture load from the water contained in the concrete itself. Over the longer term, though, the higher thermal mass and capacity of the concrete to absorb and retain heat may provide a more efficient response to heating and cooling, depending on the building's purpose. In contrast, a largely timber structure, using cross-laminated timber panels, for instance, will have lower moisture loadings initially, but will have less capacity to retain heat, so may require a different approach to HVAC system design. As with many aspects of design, there is no one-size-fits-all solution that can be applied universally, but rather a balancing act of pros and cons must be addressed together, and in full knowledge of the impact and influence of each decision on the others. From the starting point of a good high-level understanding of the building type, purpose and location, we can then consider the lower-level design factors, the interactions of the heat, air and moisture in the building. In order to do this, we undertake a hydrothermal assessment of the structure. The most detailed method for this type of assessment is one conducted using a WUFI software in accordance with the EN15026 standard. This methodology uses dynamic numerical simulation to account for heat and moisture flows, as well as the capacity of building materials to store moisture. In contrast to the older and less detailed Glazer method calculations used by the EN13788 standard, this dynamic assessment incorporates the effects of the full range of moisture sources, such as initial moisture loads and external weather, and can assess these effects over long time periods rather than a simple annual cycle. This type of detailed assessment is important as it can be used to confirm the suitability of a range of solutions to control not just the movement of moisture, but also the movement of air. It's often said that airtight buildings can be like living in a plastic bag. However, this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what we mean by airtight buildings. Reducing the air leakage simply means eliminating sources of air infiltration and exfiltration over which we have no control, drafts in other words. A good supply of fresh air is a critical component of healthy indoor environments, so when we talk about air tightness we really mean unintentional air openings and the uncontrolled exchange of air from outside to inside and vice versa. It's also not really possible for a building to be too airtight. Less unplanned air movement may require a corresponding increase in planned air movement, but any combination of ventilation strategy and air leakage rates can be used as long as design targets are achieved on site. As with the required levels of thermal insulation, what is important when considering the effects of air leakage on the specification of HVAC systems is that the performance of the system as built match that specified at the design stage. If the finished building fails to meet its design air leakage rate, over or under, then complex and expensive remediation work may be required to ensure regulatory compliance. Ensuring products and systems are not only specified correctly, but those specifications are adhered to, is therefore key to ensuring today's highly optimised building design perform as intended. The two basic factors affecting air movement are infiltration and exfiltration, air moving in and air moving out of the envelope, and there are various mechanisms which drive this. These are common to all building types to some extent. The first, stack pressure, arises from the stack effect in the building. This is an important driving force behind passive ventilation strategies. However, if not properly designed for, it can lead to air leakage problems. Stack pressure is caused by convection currents within the building, where warmer air rising through the structure draws cold air in at the lower levels. This creates pressure gradients as shown, from outside to inside at the lower levels, and from inside to outside higher up. This becomes more pronounced the taller the building gets. 
The second, wind pressure, results from a difference in pressure between the windward and leeward sides of the building. The positive pressure on the upwind side pushes from outside to in, and the negative pressure downwind draws internal air outwards. Being driven by weather, the directionality and extent of this pressure can vary considerably. We also have to consider the effects of shelter provided by surrounding structures and any variations that may occur between the upper and lower storeys of a building. The final air pressure driver is mechanical pressure, associated with ventilation and air conditioning systems. In high-rise residential and commercial structures, large air handling equipment is capable of creating substantial pressure drops within the building. Natural sources provide pressures of up to 10 pascals, whilst mechanical system can go as high as 60 pascals. If this is not managed correctly, it can contribute by drawing air into the building envelope from unintended sources. Additionally, if the system is not installed well, leaking ductwork may draw air into the system that has not been accounted for, with a corresponding detrimental effect on the efficiency of both the system and the building as a whole. The common factor across all these mechanisms is the presence of holes in the building envelope, through which uncontrolled air movement can occur. In the case of a building meeting the approved document L pressure test backstop result of 10 metres cubed per square metre per hour, this is equivalent to an opening the size of a 20 pence piece for every square metre of floor area. In order to reduce the air leakage rate, a robust and adaptable solution to closing off these air leakage paths is required. The primary design consideration we're looking at here is limiting unplanned air movement through the building fabric, but our design must also reduce the risks associated with condensation and excess moisture. Traditionally, these two functions would be performed by the same membrane, an air and vapour control layer, or AVCL. Most vapour control layers will also perform the function of an air barrier, but it is by no means a given that this method is suitable for all projects, particularly in facade systems. For some facade build-ups, the vapour control function may not even be necessary, and the inclusion of the vapour control layer simply adds an additional process and more complexity for no benefit, just one more thing to go wrong. Which leads to a further consideration. Is using a vapour barrier to control air leakage in fact a liability? Whilst this certainly isn't the case on every project, if our overall design strategy is to simplify and reduce potential points of failure in the design, it is something worth bearing in mind. We discussed earlier how an in-depth hydrothermal assessment can be used to validate our approach to minimising air leakage, and this is where we can use the results of such an assessment to full advantage. If the overall build-up works without an internal AVCL membrane, then the air barrier layer can be moved elsewhere, offering significant advantages. The principal benefits of extremely low air leakage design is the flexibility it gives designers to reduce insulation thickness or performance. For example, it may allow thinner boards to be used or a rigid foam board to be replaced with less combustible but lower performing mineral fibre without affecting energy efficiency. Depths and quantities of flashy materials such as EPDM can also be reduced. Taken together, these changes can not only assist in meeting wider design objectives but can often add up to substantial cost savings. This flexibility can only be fully utilised, however, if the design air leakage can realistically be achieved on site. As we can see here, if we keep the air and vapour barrier internal, that means a lot of tape and mastic required to seal all the switches, sockets, pipework and other services that modern buildings require. Whilst this need not necessarily pose a problem, the nature of sites and trades, particularly in the UK, is such that VCL integrity cannot necessarily be depended on. Unless contractors of all disciplines are aware of the importance of this layer, suitably trained and equipped to avoid damaging it, and afforded sufficient time and space to undertake works in a manner that avoids puncturing this membrane, the scope for problems is limitless. Features like service voids, flexible pipe and cable gaskets, and sealed light fittings can all go some way to mitigating these risks, but these all increase costs and time demands and aren't necessarily familiar to all contractors. It can also take far longer on site to ensure every joint and penetration is adequately taped and sealed, often requiring different types of tape for different circumstances. Acquiring all these tapes and sealants can also pose challenges if needed at short notice. 
Such issues can lead to improvisation on site in order to meet deadlines, which in turn can lead to pressure test failure and complex remediations. Ensuring the simplest to achieve solution is specified considerably reduces the likelihood of such issues arising, and here external air barriers come into their own. Using a fully adhered external air barrier system, such as Raptite, means the air barrier layer is located away from any service runs or structural penetrations. The vapour permeability of Raptite also allows the airtight line to be positioned more or less anywhere within the build-up without adversely affecting moisture movement. On the outside of a building, there are far fewer penetrations to seal, and those that are present tend to be larger and simpler to seal. Because the membrane is adhered fully to the substrate, it's also better to resist damage. The self-adhesive backing also makes sealing laps and joints simple and fast. Depending on the construction method, the membrane itself can also be fitted off-site, allowing it to provide protection during transportation as well as during construction. This also facilitates straightforward sealing of complex curves and forms, and means features such as floor zones and roof and wall junctions can be easily dealt with by simply wrapping the whole building in a single product. Once the membrane is in place, the building shell is then wind and watertight, so progress can be made on fitting out and air pressure testing can be undertaken much earlier in the build schedule, giving more flexibility on timings and potentially easier fixes to any problems which do arise. The primary benefit of the Raptite system is not so much that it reduces the overall air leakage rate, the more that it makes achieving design air leakage rates far easier and more reliable. This in turn allows the benefits of airtight construction to be fully accounted for and integrated into a holistic design without fear of expensive and awkward remediations if targets are not met. The vapour permeability of Raptite also allows flexibility in insulation placement. It's perfectly possible, for example, to wrap a timber frame building with insulation between stud work in Raptite and then fit external insulation to layers to limit cold bridging without causing any moisture problems. The Raptite membrane also has a Euroclass B reaction to fire rating, meaning it can be used on all heights of buildings. We'll now move on to look at fire applications in more detail. Let's begin by considering some of the fire tests that are used and how they relate to the specifics of particular designs. Historically, BS476 was the most commonly used form of fire test in the UK, and it's comprised of various different sections or parts. The most commonly referenced of these parts were parts 4, 6, 7 and 11, which variously deal with the combustibility and fire spread characteristics of materials. BS476 uses bench scale tests, which are conducted on very small samples and tightly focused on a particular aspect of performance in isolation. The way in which this testing was integrated into the building regulations did not always adequately account for this narrow scope, however, so BS476 has now been largely superseded. The EN ISO 13501 Euroclass fire classification system is a newer and more extensive test regime introduced to harmonise fire testing across the EU. The classification system relies on data from several test methods, some of which are similar to those by BS476, such as EN ISO 1182, which tests combustibility, and EN ISO 1716, which determines the calorific value of energy release associated with combustion. This energy release is a particularly important consideration for membranes which, while often combustible, will have virtually no effect in overall fire development due to their lack of calorific value. The final parts of the assessment are the EN 13823 Single Burning Item Test and the Simplified Classification System, which expresses many performance criteria in a single, easily comparable value. The Single Burning Item Test is an intermediate scale test where a standardised test assembly is exposed to direct ignition from a flame source. The amount of heat and smoke produced during this test is then measured and used to determine the Euro class, which works like this. The first part is the overall fire class. Class A1 materials are fully non-reactive when exposed to fire, whilst those in class A2 have an extremely limited reaction in terms of smoke and droplet production. Class B products are combustible but with a very limited contribution to the overall fire development, with C to E products making increasingly large contributions to the fire development. 
Alongside this is the classification adds the S and D suffixes, denoting smoke emission and droplet productions. S1 means smoke emission is weak or absent, through to S3 meaning high intensity smoke production. Likewise, D0 is no droplets, whilst D2 means high levels of dripping. This simple and universal system makes comparisons of fire characteristics simple in regulatory terms, but it's not without problems as the classes can accommodate a broad range of performance. The test also doesn't look at how the systems specified interact with each other in a fire situation. The most recent test method used in the UK is the BS8414 test, revised just this year. This is the largest scale test commonly used and aims to give an accurate representation of the performance of a fully integrated wall assembly. In essence, this test is a supersized single burning item test, and in this test, products are integrated into complete constructions representing the entire wall assembly. The fire source, called a crib, is inset at the bottom of the test structure to simulate a fire breaking out of a window and spreading up a facade. Because this test incorporates a full wall build-up in a realistic scenario, BS8414 is very much the gold standard of fire testing in the UK. However, these tests are expensive to undertake and limited in general applicability, as they relate to a very specific construction. There are also a limited number of test locations and test slots available. A BS8414 test report does however contain a lot of useful insight that can be applied across different constructions. It can still be of some use to inform expectations of performance based on EN13501 classifications, if an exactly matching test is not available. This should, however, be done with caution and careful consideration of the overall build-ups and material under test. Alongside these various tests, third-party product certification and accreditation can also be vital in determining the suitability of a product or system for a given application. Documentation like BBA certification can include details on fire ratings and any restrictions that might apply, such as ratings only being applicable to specific substrates, which may be necessary to consider. When considering the fire performance of structures, specifiers have to balance combustibility against a range of performance factors. Whilst it's easy to simply say we'll make the entire structure incombustible, this may have impacts on the hydrothermal performance of the building or on its air leakage. Some weatherproofing systems, whilst incombustible, do not allow sufficient moisture transfer to comply with the recommendation of BS5250, the Code of Practice for Condensation Control. So in upgrading fire performance, we may create problems in other areas. The key to achieving the delicate compromise is good information based on appropriate testing. Ensuring that materials used in the design are incombustible where appropriate and practical, but that where combustible products must be used, any fire risk is minimised and clearly understood in the overall context. The BR135 guidance document uses the following model to illustrate the development of a fire, and it highlights this contextual approach very well. A rapid fire spread occurs when an initial fire develops and flashes over, and is then spread to all areas simultaneously by the outer cladding layers, in turn starting fires across all the areas of the building. Where the fire spread is restricted, the initial fire develops and flashes over, but can only ignite a single secondary fire directly adjacent. The fire will only develop further if the secondary fire also develops. This is a much slower process and allows far more time to contain each area of the fire and to evacuate occupants. In this model, how any external membranes react to fire is important. If the membrane is mechanically fixed and taped, there is a potential for fire to spread on both surfaces of the material, as oxygen can feed into the fire on either side. With a fully adhered membrane like Raptite, only the outer surface can contribute to this development of the fire, as there are no gaps between the membrane and the substrate. This inhibits the supply of oxygen to the fire and slows down the spread of fire across the membrane. The way membranes react to fire is also not always accurately reflected in on-paper test data. This test here, conducted by the University of Edinburgh, is a comparative test based on the single burning item tests and shows our fire shield membrane next to a competing material. Both these materials have an identical class B S1 D0 rating on paper, so could be considered equivalent. In practice though, the difference in performance is obvious. How this disparity can be tested, quantified and accounted for in regulations is something we're currently discussing with the BBA, amongst others. 
It highlights the importance of reviewing test data for a given product, ensuring its performance meets what is expected. FireShield is a BBA certified vapour permeable membrane for use in timber frame wall and facade applications, where fire performance is of paramount importance. We covered fire testing and performance in more detail earlier in our webinar series, so if it's of interest you can go back and review that. The key point to remember when specifying for fire and facade systems, however, is to integrate product manufacturers and installers into the design process at the earliest opportunity to ensure the correct data is used as the basis for design. With that in mind, we'll now move on to our Q&A session. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I hope everyone's doing well and thank you very much um, for joining what is now our 15th um, webinar. Um, so very exciting. So some familiar trends with some of the, the previous ones we've done earlier in the year, um, but as always, updated information and hopefully you find it interesting and ed educational. Um, as you know, we will um, try our best to answer all of your questions, so we will stay here as long as required. So I've already seen some coming through on the YouTube feed, which is fantastic, and a lot via email, which we tend to get um, when we send out the reminders prior to the webinars. So we'll just work our way through. Um, all the information from today's webinar is available on, available on our webinar page at proctorgroup.com forward slash webinar. Um, so there you can ask for a meeting with one of our technical representatives, you can download your personalised CPD um, uh, certificate, um, and there's a lot of other information that's available via that, that page on our website, so please have a look if you have time. Um, we do love getting your feedback um, and as I've said previously, um, we do read it all, I read it all personally um, and certainly we use it to shape and um, you know, take a lot, of, a lot of your comments on board for uh, our future webinars. So if you have time, you will receive a, an email after this um, webinar is finished which will have a link to the feedback survey and also um, you know, the, the replay of the video which you can circulate and um, a lot of other links to information. That would be great. Um, it really helps if it's, it, us if you give us a thumbs up or subscribe to our YouTube channel um, below. So if you can do that, that's fantastic. And you can again keep keep informed by any, any new videos that we post or any new webinars we have coming up. Um, this week we have some familiar faces. Um, so returning again, um, we have Ian Fernington, who's our technical director at the Proctor Group. Good morning. Good, great. Um, and Pam, who is our senior technical advisor. Morning, everyone. So Pam and Ian are both based in um, Perthshire near our offices, and um, so we're we're still home working at the moment. So we've been blessed with quite a beautiful day today, um, which is nice. Hopefully, you guys are enjoying it. Um, and James Brackenry Johnson is based in Eastbourne. He's our London Techn Technical Specification Manager. Good morning. Um, and Mark is in Derby, um, and Mark is our Business Development Manager for High Rise and Facade. So, um, morning, Mark. Morning. Great. Um, okay, so I think we'll just um, you know, start with some of the questions that we've received and we can go ahead. So I'll start with some of the ones that we've had on YouTube and bear with me. Now, if you have any further questions, please feel free now to either post them in the YouTube feed, email them to webinar at proctorgroup.com and you can also DM us on Twitter at Proctor Group. So bear with me because we are getting quite a lot of questions in from different uh, platforms. So we will try to get to them all. If we miss any, and it has happened historically, we will email you later on. Um, so we will just start. So on the, uh, through YouTube, Pam, if I can come to you first, um, Cora has asked, why does Fire Shield need to be facing in cavity, but Raptite can be installed on sheathing behind the insulation when they're the same classification? Yeah, it's a really good question, actually, and we get to ask quite a lot. Um, it's really a case of how these individual products work. Um, if we take Raptite first, um, because it's fully adhered to the substrate, um, we are only there to provide the airtightness line and uh, to protect the substrate from moisture ingress. Um, but that bond, as we saw in the video earlier, um, that really limits the risk of air being able to get in behind the membrane. Um, which reduces the, the ability for fuel to the fire and also for that membrane or that cavity to, to allow um, the fire to pass up behind it. Um, Raptite also has a tendency to kind of shrink back from flames as well. Um, and it's, 
it's not really got much of a, a calorific value. It's not, um, there's not a lot of energy given off by it during um, the testing. Uh, and that is obviously what's tested during um, BSEN 13509, uh, 13501 testing. Um, you've also got to remember that Placed against the sheathing, Raptite is protected by the insulation that's going on the face of it as well. So it's got almost like a, a, a double protection layer from the sheathing behind and the insulation in front. Um, now, Fire Shield, that reacts in a totally different way. Um, it's a, more of a passive protection solution. So it actually is an intumescent coating. So it foams up and chars and that provides a physical barrier to the substrate. Um, as well as sort of starving oxygen and preventing that fire spreading across the surface. So it really tries to stop that spread of the fire. Um, it, it's worth noting um, that no intumescent coating will ever get beyond a class B. Um, you cannot get A1 or A2 by their very nature. They have to react to fire and give off energy to foam. And because of that, they can't fit into the, the, the calorific value um, parameters that are set out in BS EN 13501 and um, so there will always be be too high for that that's just your sad fact for the day. <laughs> okay that's great thank you Pam interesting um, and Pam just want to got you one here um, from Mark um, around passive house um, content and certification so mm -hmm. Just mentioning that during the thermal bridging air tightness section, um, they didn't no mention of passive house design or detailing. Mm -hmm. um, and just wondering if our products do have certification. Can you clarify that a little yeah. bit? Yeah, I, I, our guys that are handling the feed there did mention that um, we did have a, a passive house uh, presentation a few weeks back. So that's available certainly on our website to go back to if you want to mark. Um, at the moment, we're also exhibiting uh, virtually on the passive house um, online exhibition. Um, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> Passive House is a great solution. It's a it's a great method to follow uh, to follow and to certify to, but the principles are quite the same between whether you're doing Passive House or or low energy um, designs, low air uh, or high air tightness buildings. It's about that continuity. Um, I'm not going to get into too much on on that side of things because as I say, we did do a full webinar on that earlier on, but on the certification point of view. Um, two of our products, the Raptite and our ProCheck Adapt, um, which is a, an intelligent vapor control layer. Um, both of them have got um, Passive House certification on them and are on the website and in the virtual exhibition. Indeed, and using a lot of Passive House projects, of course. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, and Mark, if you need more information on that, then you know, please email us directly if you have a project in mind or, or more questions on a specific topic. And we can actually email you the link to the Passive House presentation if you didn't get an invite to that. Um, quite informative as well. Um, okay, great. Um, come, just going back the way, um, James had asked, so Mark, if I can come to you for this one, please. Um, James had asked, um, is a self-adhered external air barrier suitable for use on recladding projects and what benefits does it offer? Uh, yeah, morning everyone. Yes, it's, it's, it is uh, suitable for use on recladding projects and we're dealing with it with a number of those um, at, at the moment. So re these recladding projects will typically involve uh, removal of ACM panels, plastic foam insulation, uh, sheathing boards and EPDM. So particularly on concrete frame buildings, uh, the removal of EPDM uh, from those concrete columns uh, and floor slab uh, edge details. So Raptite really allows for the removal of EPDM in those areas. So that reduces the fire load to, um, with, with the recladding um, works that are going ahead uh, and also the cost and, and um, of labour and materials uh, for the replacement of, of, of EPDM in those areas. So being fully self adhered the membrane literally wraps the buildings we saw in the uh, uh, presentation. So right across the sheathing boards, right across the concrete columns and floor slabs. Uh, and a simple backer rod detail allows for an effective expansion joint or movement of the membrane where, where, where it's required, where necessary. Um, and again, as we saw in the presentation with regards to, to energy efficiency, by improving the air tightness of the structure, we can demonstrate, um, or third party will demonstrate through SAP or SBEM calculations, that sensible levels of um, insulation can be used. So you're a class A1 mineral fibre insulation as opposed to the plastic foam. Uh, and that may allow you to, to keep everything within the original footprint of the building. So again, reducing the cost of um, um, additional length of fixings that would otherwise be required when installing an insulation material with, with a, a lower lambda value. 
So uh, lots of benefits. They're just a few that we've touched upon. Um, and I sort of advise that you get in touch uh, and speak to us uh, with any of those type of projects. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, so many hidden benefits that aren't necessarily product benefits when you're looking at the overall life cost and performance of the building. So um, thank you for that, Mark. Um, Stephen had also asked about the regulations. So Ian, we'll give a regulation one to you as our technical director. Um, so basically, just, I mean, why is there a difference in regulations between Scotland and England? OK, um, well, it's, a, it's a great question. and don't want to get too nationalistic about this um, as to why that there's differences. I know there's, there's a question, the answer was devolution. Um, yeah, it, it is a, a different one. I mean, even, even the definition of high rise um, is different in Scotland compared to England. In England, it's over 18 metres and Scotland, it's over 11 metres. Um, so there's a time and place for nationalism, um, but building regulations when it's protecting people's lives, I don't think is the time uh, or the place. Um, I think it's more the point that I think there needs to be collaboration between the different regulatory bodies. Um, Scotland, for example, have a great uh, history in terms of fire protection, um, no fatalities, um, in buildings where there's been the original fire uh, origin hasn't spread um, and, and other countries can learn from that and I think if there was collaboration between the different countries um, it would make it easier for people to understand and everybody to comply with what is best fire protection for different types of buildings. Okay, good. And someone's just posted another one, Steve Skadesbrook. Um, he's just wondering how the fire regs around the, the globe differ. So that might be a bit more difficult to answer, but is there a collective body that tracks these fire regulations? Um, I, I'm not quite sure, um, Steve. Um, good morning. Um, I know that in the past uh, I sat on various European uh, committees and one thing that we weren't able to really get involved in was fire um, because the European, every different country uh, had a different regulation and therefore there was a separate fire committee to deal with fire and whatever we were working on, the section on fire would just be dropped in once the fire regulatory bodies decided which was the best harmonised standard. Um, but the harmonisation of those standards did take a lot longer. Um, because everybody thought that their regulations were the best and should be adopted, um, which tends to be the case when you've got different countries uh, trying to harmonise. Um, so, a good question, Steve. I'm not quite sure whether there is a overriding regulatory body that can collaborate, but if there's not, certainly would be a good way forward. Yeah, and I think often these regulations are born out of, unfortunately, you know, tragedy. We saw what happened in the Middle East with a lot of the, the high-rise fires in the built-up buildings, you know, the likes of Dubai, etc. And that spurred, you know, a ton of um, regulation change there. And then, of course, in the UK. And, and so it's unfortunate, but um, good question. Okay. Yeah. Um, Pam, if I can come back to you, I've had two quite similar questions via email about um, the regulations around fire. And I know that some of you are quite well versed on. So if you bear with me, let me ask them both because they kind of uh, cross over. So Paul has asked, why did BS 13501 supersede BS 476, part six and seven? And um, so what was wrong with the old classification methods that we were all so familiar with? Um, and Carly has asked, I commonly specify class O or class one materials when tested to BS 476, is this wrong? So if you can kind of take both of those or, or individually, whatever you find easy. Okay. Um, Going back to the first one, so that was the, why did the uh, BSEN 13501 supersede? I think Ian kind of touched on it there. Um, the BS476 was a, a UK test method, whereas the 13501 is um, very much a, a European harmonised standard. So they got their act together and produced that. So that is static. Um, that is the same test method across the board, which makes specification a lot easier. Um, so the, 
the one, the, the BS476, um, for membranes, certainly it was mainly sort of part six and seven. So that was the, the surface um, spread of flame. So they were only looking at what happened to the fire across that surface. They didn't take anything else into account. But 13501, which uses the single burning item, um, it very much looks at the product in a representative arrangement, which is characteristic of the actual end use. So it's a lot more, um, it's interesting to see how it goes, but it's a lot more applicable um, to what's going on. And then they also looked at the benefits or the requirement to look at the, the smoke and, um, and droplet index, you know, what does that pr produce? So um, something, for example, like a, like a, a panel that you might have, like a, a cladding panel, which might have aluminium on the outside um, with a foam filler in the middle of it, were quite popular for recladding buildings. We know, sadly, they were a contributing factor to Grenfell. If you tested it to the BS476, that surface would work and perform very well. So you'd probably get a class O or class one. But it didn't take into account what effect on the fire that core would. Um, and obviously that core could produce a lot of smoke uh, and, and droplets, which could then transfer the fire elsewhere. And obviously smoke's an, an issue as well. Um, so going in, linking into that second part, which was about the class O, the sort of the specification of it, the bringing in of um, BSEN 13501 superseded and replaced um, BS476. So although you can still get it, it's not one that's in regulatory, it's not recommended to be the one that you follow. Um, it's still used a lot for things like tapes, et cetera, and some products, but for things like building membranes and products, you really should be looking for a, a 13501. It gives more information on how the, the product will actually perform in situ. Yeah, so I mean, essentially it's, it's not wrong. She should be looking for the, the newer regs, but there'll be also a bit of a transition period with everything. Um, exactly, it exactly. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's it, you're right. It's very much the, the 13501 is the updated standard. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what you really should be ideally looking for. Okay, good. Okay, thanks, Pam. Um, James, Simon asked a little bit earlier on, if I can come to you, please. Um, do you, how do you cater for large structural penetrations planned or unplanned? Okay, great question, Simon. Thank you. Um, in regards to um, large structural penetrations, <laughs> plan side of things, from our point of view, uh, what we tr try and do is get involved as early as we can do with the architect uh, or indeed with the specifier in order to make sure that we can detail um, those areas in particular. Because obviously what we're trying to do is uh, maintain the air tightness that's been designed for the building um, so that obviously once built, uh, it achieves the air tightness parameters that it's been designed to. So no, no expensive remedial measures have to happen. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take that penetration detail. Obviously, what we'll try and do is work with the architect to make sure we have as limited amount of large penetrations as possible. But obviously, we'll, we'll CAD detail those uh, penetrations to make sure that we've address that area to make sure that when the contractor gets to site that we can be there as well uh, and make sure that, that that detail is specifically looked at and concentrated on. I know um, my colleague Mr Lamborn has an issue with this but devil is in the detail um, and so if we address those details if we address those penetrations whether they be small whether they be large because as, as you said earlier uh, in regards to a 20p piece that can obviously lead to a substantial air leakage point. So we need to address these areas and make sure that they are they are addressed from a design point of view, obviously from a planned position. From an unplanned position, we do the site visits, uh, we monitor the projects going on with the contractors. If they have any questions, if they have any problems, if they get to a detail and they don't know how to deal with it, then we can be on site in order to uh, address the problem and make sure that it, it is resolved as quickly as possible uh, and you maintain the air tightness. Okay, great. And James, um, just quickly, um, design coordination and management have been asked on YouTube, just while you're talking about detailing and drawings and the, the devil being in the detail. Um, yeah. he, he's asked, or, or he or she has asked, are you able to put an airtight red line on drawings with the recommended products, airtightness strategy, et cetera? Yes, 
uh, in, a, in a word. Um, obviously, what we can do is we can work with the drawings. If you've got a specific facade detail that you're working with, um, we can obviously put in uh, where the where the where the membrane needs to be. We'll carry out a U-value condensation risk, and if required, a Wolfie analysis in order to make sure um, that that it's catered for and that it's it's in the correct place and it's the correct membrane from the job. Obviously, from the other point of view of removing that um, potential unsuitable membrane from the inside with a VCL, we can potentially remove that VCL requirement within there. Um, however, obviously, if, if the client, if the warranty provider wishes to have a VCL in there from a, a Class B uh, area or indeed an A2 area, then obviously we can provide that membrane as well at the same time. So whatever area that you're going into, we can provide that as well. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, James. Um, Mark, if I can come back for you, please. A couple of questions um, about air leakage. So strangely, Mark has actually asked um, by email, how do you limit air leakage when installing fixing through an external air barrier uh, to mount helping hand brackets for brick wall tie systems? Right, okay. Um, great name, Mark. Uh, another 60s child, I'd imagine. Um, wrap tight, it's, it's uh, fully adhered um, to the substrate as we've seen in the, uh, in, the, in the earlier video there. So due to the physical properties of the membrane, um, obviously the three layers uh, and also that adhesive layer as well, um, third party testing has really confirmed that air leakage is limited and there's a degree of uh, self sealing which is achieved. Um, now there are additional measures that can be taken. So by using wrap type liquid uh, applied flashing, for example, you can seal against moisture ingress and, and, and air leakage if required. And as James says, the devil is in the detail. Every project differs. Advice can be sought from our installation guides or by a, a virtual uh, or on-site uh, toolbox talks to ensure best practice. Um, and we've really been doing uh, a lot of that at the moment. Um, it's quite useful to have not only the main contractor, but the subcontractor on site, uh, and obviously myself and my colleagues involved in, in sort of um, virtual uh, meetings, which then uh, help and assist everyone to make sure that all the detailing is carried out uh, correctly and issues such as that can be uh, avoided really. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, um, Mark. I um, appreciate it. Um, Ian, I haven't spoken to you for a while, um, so I will come back to you if that's okay. Um, Murray has asked, I have various areas that I'm concerned about cold bridging, um, but some of the solutions appear not to have the limited or non-combustible classification I need, question mark. Okay. Um, yeah, it probably comes on from uh, the question that was asked earlier about passive house and thermal bridging, cold bridging, etc. Um, obviously, we, we deal with heat, air and moisture. Doctors and, and dealing with the harm principles of how to balance it. When you put in fire into that, it adds another dimension and um, sometimes another complication, um, which we've been working hard on, on coming up with various solutions from fire, whether it be vapor control layers or the vapor permeable membrane that, that Pam mentioned earlier in, in terms of fire shield. Um, yeah, in terms of Thermal insulation, um, some of the solutions for cold bridging can be um, or, or cannot have the required fire protection that you're looking for. Um, we've worked hard um, trying to improve that and we now have an A2 um, space therm, um, which has obviously the A2 classification, which gives you limited combustibility. So it allows you that fire performance along with the thermal insulation while still keeping its water repellency and vapor permeability. Um, so they can, can combine together to give you the fire performance and the thermal bridge um, reduction. Um, so Space Therm A2 would be the, the solution for that one. We can help uh, if you have specific details um, and detail in it uh, with our tech desk uh, based at head office. Okay, good. And Ian, just on that, I'm not sure this one you'll be able to answer. Dave has asked, um, any ideas what fire tests may be required for um, IWI systems for retrofit legacy buildings? Retrofit legacy buildings? Um, yeah, I, th I think the, the same general principles uh, of moisture on 
existing buildings, a lot of the solutions would be to use a major insulation board. But as we previously discussed in previous webinars, sometimes a rigid board isn't the best option and you want a degree of breathability on solid walls. Um, the fire protection of that um, is a debatable point. Um, whether people actually need that fire resistance, whether it's under building regulations, if you're doing improvements or not. Um, so the, the fire regulations with that would not be quite as clear as external wall insulation, which has been more con concentrated on in the past. Um, so you can still use insulations that are potentially flammable internally as a solution, um, but you probably have to deal with your own independent uh, council to decide whether it was going to be suitable or not. In the fire. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, Pam, um, Josh has asked, why are there exemptions in ADB? Why can't all elements in the wall be class A? Yeah, um, I think uh, people, Mark and James get asked this quite a lot and it, 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 it's coming through. So this is stemmed from obviously the inclusion um, and the updating um, and regulations. So there is this assumption that everything needs to be A when you're looking at um, up over 18 metres. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it would be great if they all could be, but not every part of that outer um, facade or that outer wall has the same function to play. Um, so certain things need certain um, key criteria, physical properties, material benefits. So, for example, things like membranes, sealants, gaskets, pipes, expansion joints tend to be made of sort of plastic based type materials, which can in enough quantity give out quite a lot of energy and calorific energy, which can contribute. But they need to have that flexibility that's given by these com compounds to be able to move and flex with the building. They need to be able to, to seal off and weatherproof areas. To make them non-combustible, it can be really difficult because quite often you have to take out that element that gives it its flexibility and replace, replace it with something um, that doesn't burn. Um, tends to be things like ceramics, glass, stone, that sort of thing. But unfortunately, by their very nature, they tend to be quite hard and unyielding products, which you can make a tease out of them, but they quite often are quite brittle um, and just won't give enough flexibility and adhesive um, to be able to be used. So it gives us that catch-22 situation where we need to accept that sealants that may be a, an element that may have um, a greater combustibility than would fall into a class A1 or A2 um, criteria. But we still have to use them because we need them to, to waterproof our windows, etc. cetera. Um, so again, it keeps coming back to this, you have to look at your building as a whole. You have to look at how everything interacts with each other. Um, you know, things like Raptite, as I think it was James said earlier, you know, use of that can limit the use of EPDM. Um, you know, and there's probably more mass in EPDM because it's a thicker membrane compared to Raptite. So it's, it's really looking at the building as a whole and switching out what you can do, but accepting that things like sealants and gaskets, etc., are a much smaller part of the building as a whole and will contribute less than something like a large block of insulation um, on that wall. Okay, good, thank you very much. Um, so James, coming back to your a wrap type question from Carl, I've got a couple for you actually, so um, I'll, I'll do one first. Um, Carl's asked, how does wrap type work at junctions with fire barriers within a cavity? With fire barriers within a cavity? Yes, yeah, within oh, Sorry. Um, Right, okay, yeah, I mean, whether the fire barrier, from a high-rise perspective, whether the fire barrier is, is vertical or horizontal, um, the raptite, obviously, with, with a standard membrane, what you'd be looking at is terminating that membrane prior to the uh, fire barrier or lapping it onto the fire barrier. Um, with the raptite, obviously, what we're after is the continuity side of things in regards to air tightness. So the raptite can continue behind that uh, fire barrier, whether it's flush or recessed. Um, what we'd obviously need to know from a design perspective is obviously whether there is, what, what fixing is going to be utilised. Because obviously there's a multitude of different fire barriers out there, whether they're intumescent, whether they're full fill. 
Uh, there's also, and, and with the associated fixings, there are multiple different fixings that, that people prefer to use. So as long as we've got that sort of information, then we can advise from there. Uh, in regards to the positioning of the fire barrier, obviously, if it's a flush mounted on the facade of the system, mainly on the vertical, and it's not recessed at a floor slab level, if it's a floor slab level, we'll need to look at the deflection uh, that the floor slab, when it's loaded, is going to be undertaking. Um, and if that, if that deflection uh, is greater than what our project is capable of doing, then obviously we'll design it to uh, abide by that system as well abide by that deflection so that the product isn't damaged when the when the floor system is loaded so again it comes down to design stage or working on site making sure the contractors know about what's coming afterwards and what what impact the building is going to have on the product so as long as we're aware of that then obviously we can design from there okay great um and chris has also asked quite similarly can wrap type work with non-combustible cavity trees <laughs> Uh, Non-combustible cavity trays, obviously, this is something that has, has, has been pushed uh, in order to uh, move forward with system providers um, for the non-combustible uh, compliance uh, for high-rise properties. Um, with non-combustible, obviously, the issue with non-combustible was the fact that you were creating a cold bridge between, between the two skins. Um, there are systems out there now which are thermally broken and non-combustible. Uh, yes, we have been working with these products on site and we've done uh, some uh, bespoke uh, designs, some bespoke CAD details in order to make sure that when these uh, trays are mechanically fixed back to the substrate, that we've got that wrapped up. Pardon me. Bad one. Uh, wrapped up. It's, it's, it, the, the area is dealt with um, and uh, the, the air tightness is maintained um, through the fixings and also the heads of the fixings as well. Okay, fantastic, thank you very much. Um, Mark, um, a question here from Aaron. Are there any limitations as to how long wrap tight may be left exposed for? Okay. Um, well, in terms of, of, of water penetration, wrap tight is, is, is class W1. So it will resist therefore liquid penetration, uh, windblown snow, et cetera. So for, particularly in, in exposed locations, it's favored for, for that reason by warranty providers as it protects the sheathing boards and frame from the external moisture during the construction phase. So whilst it's BVA certified as a temporary waterproofing layer, I think as with all membranes, um, best practice would be to cover up the prime with a primary roof covering as soon as possible. So ideally we want wrap tight uh, not to be left exposed for more than 120 days. Now, with regard to that, on some of the, obviously the, the high rise residential buildings we've been doing, um, it may be required to be left exposed for longer than that. So we've actually done some uh, independent uh, sort of testing uh, with regard to uh, water vapour and air resistance. Uh, and it's confirmed that rat tight can actually be left exposed for, for up to 12 months. So, um, you know, it's, it's worth talking to us with, with regard to that. Let us know how long this membrane is like to be left exposed. Um, but uh, as I say, independent testing for up to 12 months. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, and Ian, if I can come back to you, I've got a couple of similar questions again, like I did with Pam earlier, if I can mention them both, because I feel like they kind of overlap a bit. Um, Derek has asked <coughs> the correct term for fire performance, and this is, we've, we've had chats about this going back a year or so in-house, but so reaction to fire or fire resistance, so that would be the first question. And Sam has asked, can your fire shield give my wall a fire resistance of 60 minutes? So can you kind of take them both and, and answer them how yeah. you see <clears throat> yeah, it's a, uh, it's a great question, and uh, as you say, um, you were smiling as you said it. You know, we've had this debate in Proctor's uh, many a time, and I've even had my knuckles wrapped by BRE when I talked about vapor resistance, and I was told, you know, you're talking about reaction to fire. Um, but yes, it, it's probably true that I should have got my knuckles wrapped. Reaction to fire is really what we are concerned about the majority of times in the building regulations um, for our classification A to F, for example. Um, and reaction to fire um, shows how product will, how easily or not it will ignite and how it can contribute to the fire. So it's more at the start of the fire, how it will react to fire. And just as Pam said earlier, our fire shield has a great fire performance, but it can only get class B and not A because it does react to fire. Um, 
So reaction to fire, more in interested at the start of the fire and how quickly it ignites. The resistance to fire and the fire resistance is more once the fire has developed um, and how in terms of the duration of time it will resist that fire. So hence the term fire resistance. Um, the Propter Group obviously have different fire solutions with fire resistance and reaction to fire, but mainly concentrate on the reaction to fire classifications. Okay. Yep. Good. And then the, the second question yep. was about was from Sam. Can fire should give my wall a fire resistance of sixty minutes? Yeah, that's that's a obvious great follow on question for that. Um, but in, a, in an ideal world, we would love to say Fire Shield has 60 minutes performance. It's a great performance. We've done our own internal fire tests. We've done it with Edinburgh University. We, the performance is very good. But for to give you a fire resistance of 60 minutes, it's got to be the full system that we're testing. So we can do that test, but the question would be, what is behind the Fire Shield that we want to test? So we could do it with timber frame, we could do it with SIPs, we could do it with CLT, but we would have to probably do it for every different form of construction to be able to say that it's okay for 60 minutes without the caveat if it's used in this performance with this build-up. Um, so it's probably something that we, we, we need to do, um, but you can imagine that firehouses are very difficult to get time in, uh, to book time. So it's uh, it's something that we're going to have to look at, um, but it does give you very good fire performance, um, but we just need to, to do a bit more work to be able to say, yes, it gives you 60 minutes. Okay, good. And Ian, just while we're on fire regulations, um, Eric had asked, does Reflection TF offer any fire protection? So that does have a fire sort of fire um, reaction classification, doesn't it? So maybe you can talk him through that a bit. Yeah, it, it's again a, a really good question. Because it's a foil, you would think that would have a great fire performance. In terms of the European classifications, it's a class E, um, which isn't the worst, class F. Um, but it, it does have a class E performance um, because of the other materials in that. Um, so, yeah, it does have a fire classification. If you're looking for a better car classification in timber frame, which obviously the fact the shield TF is used, fire shield would be a better performance because it gives you a class B. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. So I think I have one or maybe sort of four questions left. So I'll split those. And if there's any more, please post them down the YouTube, YouTube feed, email us, um, webinar at Proctor Group or DM us on Twitter. So we're just kind of coming to the, the final few questions. Um, so Pam, I will come back to you if that's okay. So I've got two for you and then one for the rest of the guys. Um, Daniel has asked, has said, I'm looking at a membrane that's classed B1S2D2. Surely there's a huge benefit in looking for a membrane with zero droplets or less smoke. So I think he's identifying the difference between the S2D2 and, and what we were talking about earlier in the, the webinar presentation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was it was covered quite well in those in those graphics. Um, you would think there's not a lot in it. You you really would, but um, you've got to look at what those parameters might affect within the building. So smoke's an easy one. We know smoke obscures vision, gets into our lungs, and is probably the main cause of injury in some cases, death in, in, in fires, it's smoke inhalation. Um, and that's not taking into account any you know, toxic elements that might come off or be carried within the smoke. Um, you might think it's okay because it's outside, but when fire properly takes hold, things like um, ducts and windows and everything, they go very quickly. So smoke can get back in uh, uh, quite easily. So it makes obvious sense to have as little smoke propagation from your products as, as absolutely possible. Um, the droplets aspect is, is actually just as dangerous. What happens with those is those droplets can melt off and drop and transfer the fire to other parts of the building that you haven't had them in before. Um, so it might look like 
it's actually shrinking away, but then those bits are continuing to burn and dropping and transferring the fire. Um, and that could result in, in secondary ignition elsewhere in the building and the facade and, and continuing the chain reaction. And that's really why you're wanting to look for something that has got smoke propagation factor of one and, and zero droplets produced. Okay, that's good. Um, and Kurt has also asked, what constitutes an appropriate backing in a curtain wall system to complete the fire stopping between the slab edge where the compartment line is between transoms? This has proved a problem with London Borough of Kingston upon, upon Thames building control. Quite a long question. Did you kind of catch the gist of that? Yeah, yeah. Um, to be fair, this is one that we actually got in uh, prior to this um, by email, so we were able to go back and, and get information um, on it. it. It's really a case of, of trying to decide what their question is um, and obviously where the placement of the membrane is going to be. Um, but anything like this, which is a specific one, a specific concern by, by building control, send drawings into us, we're more than happy to have a look at it and, and advise appropriately. But to summarise, you know, we have lots of membranes. We've got our fire shield and our wrap type, which we mentioned today. Um, we have vapour control layers like our, our ProCheck A2 vapour control layer and our FR200, which can be used. But these products need to be used along with other products. You know, you need to make sure that you have um, proper cavity barriers where there should be fire stops. Um, everything's sealed off for fire and it's all about compartmentalizing that fire so if it happens in one part it remains as much as possible within that part without spreading to the rest of the building or to two other buildings as well. Okay great um, thank you Pam thank you very much um, Mark um, Again, last question for you, unless any more come in. Morris has asked, where fire-related vapour control layers are specified, um, do you offer any support services to ensure membranes are actually installed properly? Uh, yeah, we do. Um, it's, it's actually important that, that contractor installers are aware of, of, of best practice and general principles, I guess, to ensure that we get high quality uh, installations. So there is this great British tradition of, of um, you know, completely ignoring the, uh, the installation guide that accompanies every delivery uh, and just cracking on uh, and, and installing the products as they believe that they should be installed. Um, so we've had the situation, particularly with some of the um, uh, ProCheck uh, vapor control membranes, where they've actually been installed uh, the wrong way round. Uh, and we've managed to pick this up very quickly and, and deal with this and, and, and get this uh, sort of amended. Um, at a very early stage. So whilst installation guides offer good general guidance, we encourage, uh, and then particularly during the current sort of climate, um, virtual toolbox talks. So we can do this via Zoom or, or Microsoft team meetings, whatever it may be, where we can meet with the main um, and, and subcontractor and address any questions or look at specific project detailing requirements. And as James said earlier, if necessary, we can do CAD details uh, and all that type of thing. Now that said, we can still, um, even during the current climate, do um, toolbox talks on site as well. In fact, we've got a, one of our guys in, in Bristol today doing exactly with that, with, with some of our ProCheck BCL membranes. So um, further to that, we can also provide compliance checks. Now, whether that be with the BCL or, or with the wrap type externally, uh, and these are useful because these give confidence that materials are being installed um, to, to the appropriate standard. So, as I said earlier, you know, please get in touch, you know, make use of these services and, and let's ensure that things get installed correctly. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. And you're right, you know, installation guides are great, but they're only as good as if they're opened and read on site, which often, um, you know, doesn't happen. So we have had a few interesting projects recently, but um, rectified and uh, no problem, thanks to you guys. So, um, great, okay, James. Um, Amin has asked, um, how do you address complex details and EPDM use? Uh, complex details, um, obviously from, from our perspective, we like to, as I mentioned before, we like to be sort of involved with uh, the design stage as much as possible. So stage three, stage four, depending upon how uh, advanced you want to be and how early. Um, but obviously, then we can deal with those details and make sure that um, we've, we've provided as much information as you say, in regards to guidelines, we can provide the information, but if people don't use that information, then obviously it's going to become a problem. Um, so as long as we can be there and provide that and build up that bank of details, then obviously it makes the, tra uh, it makes the ability to do the specification on follow-on projects uh, a lot easier. 
in regards to those details from a contractual point of view, um, the more the guys utilize the products, the more they'll understand the, the foresight that's required in order to make sure that you can, you can see a problem coming or you can see a detail that's going to be slightly complex coming and therefore you can plan ahead in regards to that. Um, EPDM, uh, sneaky little sealant product, um, dealing with that side of things, obviously we can go underneath, we can go over the top of the EPDM, it's not a problem. Uh, what we find more often than not, it's to do with the tolerances on site. If you've got a modular or off-site project, uh, the tolerance is a lot less, especially in regards to your windows and doors. So the requirement is pretty much negated or there's a very small amount of EPDM required to pack out uh, around those areas in order to seal those. From a high-rise perspective, obviously the tolerances are much greater, um, so therefore the requirement for EPDM is, is generally looked upon as, as being required. Um, but what we try and do is, is put it in the terms of the contractor in regards to the warranty provider. If LABC are there, if NHBC are there, if Premier Guarantee are there, if Zurich or another company, many are available. Uh, we will work in conjunction with what they require. We will put in, obviously, the performances of the product, um, but ultimately, for their own peace of mind, they may want it done in a particular manner, and we will doth our caps and, and make sure that that's done to their, to, their, to their requirements because they're the ones that are going to be warranting the building at the end of the day. And therefore, we'll advise the contractor in order to make sure that in order for that warranty to, to uh, get done and to be approved, then, then we'll work in that manner. But again, with EPDM, uh, it's a generic terminology. There are self-adhered EPDMs. There are multi-layered EPDMs. There are torch on EPDMs. Um, so please be aware of uh, what you're utilizing and hopefully will be aware of what you're utilizing as well and therefore advised to keep it away from open flames uh, from, a, from a torch on point of view. Um, with, but when it comes to overlaying the product with a self-adhered product or indeed with a three-part product, there is no issue in regards to bonding. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, James. Um, and Ian, last but not least, um, Jeff has asked, what about the use of a VCL? Is that a good thing or not? And what about its effect on fire? Yeah, um, good question. Um, <clears throat> we do a lot of calculations on, on VCLs. Um, and to show whether you actually need the vapor control layer or not, uh, we have a, a, obviously a range in our uh, in the Proctor family, but a lot of the times, if we do the hydrothermal assessment, we do can do a roofing calculation, depending on the occupants, the use, the insulation, and the insulation placement. Sometimes a VCL is not required, so therefore, the fire um, classification is is not as relevant. Probably goes on to the question that Dave asked, Dave McGrath asked earlier about internal wall insulation where you're using a vapor control layer because it's usually used internally on the warm side of the insulation. Um, sometimes, depends on the certification, council, there might be a requirement for a fire classification of that. Um, then we're into the same question that I answered earlier about whether it's reaction to fire or fire resistance in terms of its performance. Um, Usually we're looking at the reaction to fire here, classes A to F, of which we've got a number of solutions, um, and whether it will contribute to the fire by having a vapor control layer in there or not. Um, generally, it's better to have a vapor control layer in there to stop the moisture getting in from a moisture point of view, but you have to consider fire again if we bring that into the harm principles as well. Um, so generally, we can provide uh, solutions for that if a vapor control layer is required. We can then decide which one we want, whether it's fire resistance or reaction to fire, and we can uh, provide you a solution um, if you can uh, detect this or indeed uh, discuss with any original uh, salesman. Okay, lovely, thank you. Um, I think that's all the questions. So. Thank you very much indeed um, for everyone that's attended and thank you to you guys for answering the questions. Um, I know it's not easy answering them on the spot. Um, so a great job as always. Um, and no cats today, so my cat managed to stay out of our live webinar. Thank you, Miles, wherever he may be. Um, so anyone that's attended will receive a follow-up email. 
um, which will be a link to the replay of this webinar. So if you feel it's going to be beneficial to colleagues or anyone else, please feel free to circulate it. And um, we get an awful lot of views on these webinars at a later date. So this is our 15th, and I think we're approaching 20,000 views um, since April, which is fantastic. So we're really pleased at the number of people that are watching and, and taking in our webinar. So, so great. Um, as I said earlier, all of our information is on our webinar page um, on proctorgroup.com forward slash webinar. So there you can get, you know, sample packs and product information, literature downloads. You can request a meeting with one of these guys or our wider sales team. So we have a lot of individuals available to help you. Um, you can upload your CAD details. Um, you can request product presentations on particular areas you're interested in um, and your personalized CPD, CPD certification there as well. And you can also um, log up, log in, sign up, let me start again, sign up for our next webinar, um, which will be in two weeks. So two weeks today at the same time, 10 a.m. So Friday, the 2nd of October. So a completely different topic um, from today. Um, it's all around um, impact and airborne sound. So really the acoustic um side of things in lots of different type of construction so if that's of interest to you um please feel free to sign up um, it does help us if you give us a thumbs up or like our uh, youtube channel and um, also allows you to subscribe and you can then be informed of anything else that comes onto our channel and anything else that we're planning um, so thank you very much indeed hopefully we will see you in two weeks and uh, i'm quarantined for the next couple of weeks because i was on holiday uh, last week and the regulations changed when we were away so um, uh, we're both working from home so I'll be here um, in two weeks I'm very well prepared so I hopefully we'll see you all then and thank you um, very much everybody again guys appreciate it bye bye